Mike Bush. Mike Bush is arguably uh, the best known AMP IA in general aviation. He's the owner uh, and the writer of his company called Savvy Aviation. And he publishes and presents free aviation safety webinars for pilots and flight instructors in the aviation community via AOPA, uh, EAA, and other venues like this program, Breaking the Chain. He's a prolific writer, mechanic, mathematician. He's been a professor. He's a CFI, an aircraft owner. And in 2008, he was honored with the uh, FAA National uh, Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year Award and presented that award by the FAA Administrator. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to welcome our guest presenter tonight, Mr. Mike Bush. Mike, welcome to Breaking the Chain. It is your Good show, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Jeremy, I, I, could, I could tell you must not be an A&P because you couldn't pronounce the word analytics, so. As, <laughs> tongue tie, you know. <laughs> analytics i'm a youtuber i should be able to say that word <laughs> okay so shall i just uh go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead go and share it? your screen sir okay let's see if this works let me know if you can see my screen i've got it oh cool okay excellent um <clears throat> okay well uh let me move oh can't move that there as uh, jeremy said uh we're going to talk about um uh, predictive analytics and machine learning in uh, general aviation maintenance tonight. This is a kind of a leading edge area that uh, my company is, uh, is, has been doing a lot of R&D on. It's, I'm, I'm really, really excited about it because I think it has the potential of making a major uh, change in the way we maintain our, our general aviation uh, uh, airplanes. Um, and by the way, my, my, my company manages the maintenance of uh, a couple of thousand GA airplanes and does analytic work for probably 10,000 GA airplanes. So we're heavily involved in the real world of this stuff. It's not just, uh, it, it's, it's not, not just uh, R&D stuff that we do. But um, predictive analytics has been um, one of the most important things that have been going on in the airline uh, part of uh, aviation for well, about the last 10 years. Um, and uh, Boeing has sort of been the leader in, in this area. I, I had the opportunity several years ago to visit uh, the, the Boeing uh, Predictive Analytic uh, Command Center uh, that's uh, in uh, Denver, uh, Colorado, right next to Centennial Airport where they have that, that facility there. Um, they used to be, it's, it used to be the Jepson facility. Now it's a Boeing facility. Um, and it was, uh, incredibly impressive what they were doing. Um, but Airbus is, has been doing work in this area. Uh, Delta airlines has been a leader among the airlines and predictive analytics, uh, engine manufacturers, notably, uh, GE, um, but also, uh, Pratt and Whitney and Rolls Royce have, have been involved in this. And, and basically, what we're talking about here is um, is the use of uh, sensor data uh, derived from the aircraft and modern airline aircraft, uh, things like the 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 triple seven and the seven eight seven, are, are just little literally riddled with thousands and thousands of sensors. Pretty much anything that can be measured in that aircraft uh, has a sensor that's measuring it. And so the, the, the idea is, is to, to get the sensor data from the, from the aircraft. And there are two ways of doing that. One, sometimes it's actually telemetered to the ground in real time while the airplane's in flight. And um, that was uh, the stuff I was seeing at Boeing was all real time telemetry. And in other cases, it's stored in a data acquisition unit um, that, that's pulled out of the aircraft when it when it pulls up to the gate and uh, and, and unloaded. Um, but telemetry is uh, is is, uh, is the way the most advanced um, uh, predictive analytic uh, stuff is done and particularly but Boeing has been a leader in that. 
And this data then from all these thousands of sensors in the aircraft wind up going into a very sophisticated computer um, that, that scans the sensor data looking for patterns in the data that might be indicative of impending failure of something. And then it tries to, uh, th then it either alerts that there's a, there is a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, I mean, I'm, while I was sitting at Boeing, I noticed that there was a, one of the Boeing airliners was, was headed, I think for Tel Aviv. And the thing was saying that the, the tire pressure in, in, in one of the tires was low. And so the, 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 the folks in Tel Aviv were alerted while this airplane is in flight that, that when it pulls up to the gate, somebody's got to go out there and, and put some nitrogen in the tire is kind of, kind of interesting. Um, but in other cases, the, the computer algorithms will try to predict when uh, maintenance will be required based on the fact that, 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 that something is degrading. It hasn't degraded enough to be a problem yet, but if it's, if it's left too long, it will be a problem. So it tries to predict when um, various maintenance things uh, uh, need, need to be accomplished. And, and the whole idea is to um, reduce the amount of, of, of maintenance, uh, preventive maintenance that's done on these airplanes. That there's, the, the reason for wanting to reduce preventive maintenance is, is threefold. First of all, preventive maintenance is, is expensive. So doing more of it than you need to is, is an unneeded expense. Uh, second of all, probably more important in the airlines is that when you do preventive maintenance, it, it means the airplane is down while you're doing it and uh, they, they want the airplanes um, to be flying as much as they possibly can and not sitting in a, in a maintenance hangar. Uh, so reducing the amount of preventive maintenance, unnecessary preventive maintenance is, is going to uh, uh, reduce the amount of downtime. And, and the third reason that nobody really wants to talk about, but is one of the more important reasons is the fact that doing preventive maintenance is risky because it, it typically involves taking stuff apart and putting it back together. And, and anytime you do that, there's a risk of um, somebody putting it back together wrong, what we call a maintenance induced failure. And the maintenance induced failure problem is, is, is a, a really big problem. Mechanics don't like to talk about, but it, it's a very significant problem. And every aircraft owner has had the experience of putting your airplane in the shop uh, for, for some sort, whether it's an oil change or an annual or whatever it is, and then getting getting back out and something that was working fine when the airplane went into the shop isn't working anymore uh, and it's because the mechanic did something uh, that, that he shouldn't have done or didn't do something that he should have done and it's a very common problem and and so reducing the amount of unnecessary maintenance that's done to the airplanes reduces the the risk of maintenance induced failures so the, you know the when airplanes first started flying back when the Wright brothers were, were flying, uh, the maintenance was done in, in a corrective way. You flew the airplane until something broke and then you fixed it. Uh, we, we don't want to do that. We, we don't want things to break. Um, uh, actually, that's not true. Some things are okay to break. Uh, we, we don't want things to break that have unacceptable consequences uh, that impact the safety of the flight or impact the, uh, the mission um, by getting the airplane stuck somewhere it doesn't want to be. So in order to avoid doing corrective maintenance, waiting till things break, the, the, the traditional method was to do scheduled, regular preventive maintenance on a, on a timetable. And the problem is that when you do that, you do way more preventive maintenance than is necessary. Um, because how do you set the schedule? Well, you have to set it based on the worst case airplane in the fleet. And, and so for most airplanes, the, the schedule is going to be way too frequent. So then we started moving towards condition-based maintenance, which means that in, instead of doing preventive maintenance, we do regular inspections. And then we only mess with stuff if the inspection indicates that, that there's an impending problem. And that's an improvement. But predictive maintenance, the, the problem with condition-based maintenance is that the airplane can only be inspected, you know, at, at fairly infrequent intervals. And um, so 
doing predictive maintenance where, where we're basically doing condition-based maintenance, but we're doing it based on sensor data that we get in real time as opposed to putting the airplane in the shop and taking a whole bunch of inspection plates and peering around. Um, it lets us effectively inspect the airplane continuously. And, and uh, so the, it's, a, it's a big step closer to doing maintenance when it needs to be done but not any sooner and not any later. Um, so that, that's kind of the whole idea behind uh, predicting maintenance. So as I said, the airlines have been doing this stuff for uh, a little over a decade and, and have been getting really, really quite impressive um, results from it. But you know, what about the, the, the little airplanes at the low end of the aviation food chain where, where most of us hang out? Um, so, let me tell you, uh, my company's been doing some work in this. We're certainly not where the airlines are, um, but but um, and we certainly don't have airplanes that have the the density of sensors <laughs> that the airlines have. Um, but we're moving in the right direction. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, what what uh, we've been doing. Um, we got into the. In, into the business of looking at, at uh, data from general aviation airplanes um, uh, in 2013. Um, so we've been doing doing this for almost a decade now. Um, roughly half the piston GA fleet now. Uh, I, the exact number isn't really isn't really knowable, but something like half, maybe a little more than half, the GA fleet is equipped with some sort of recording engine monitor, but whether it's a fairly primitive one like the JPI EDM 700, there are lots of those flying around. They've been around for a long time. Or some of the you know, modern glass cockpit stuff. We, we, we work with a lot of Cirrus aircraft that, that have extremely good instrumentation and all sorts of sensors, uh, not just uh, sensors on the engine, but, but on the electrical system and on air data and all sorts of other things. Um, so in 2013, we, we started getting into the business of, of analyzing this data and, and we, we did it kind of the hard way. We, we, we created a, a very sophisticated platform that, that, where the data could be uploaded and, and, and graphed out and created a bunch of tools for, for doing various kind of analytical work on, on this data. Um, and we we gave access free access to the to the platform for anybody who wanted to use it. They can upload the data to it and use all of these tools for free. But we also built a a, a team of trained data analysts to, to to be able to look at this stuff and do uh, diagnostic kinds of, of things. And we've got about ten analysts on that team right now. That basically all they do is is look at engine monitor data for, for clients that uploaded the data and and uh, uh, do an, an analysis on it and try to come up with, with pinpoint diagnoses of what of uh, what might be wrong. So we've been doing this for a while, and at this point, we've we've got uh, data now from about four million um, piston GA flights. Each flight represents something like thirty five thousand individual sensor uh, data points. A lot a lot of these devices capture data from their sensors every one second or every two seconds. So um, that, that's quite a lot of data for each flight. And with 4 million flights in there, we, we have something like 14 billion uh, measurements in our, in our database. Um, nobody's ever aggregated uh, that kind of data from, from piston GA aircraft before. And we have enough data now that we can do some pretty interesting things with it. Um, and we, we, we've been doing a lot of interesting R&D, trying to uh, figure out how to make the best use of all of this uh, and data that we've aggregated. So one of the first things we, we did was, was to um, provide uh, something to our clients called a report card. And the idea of a report card would be that we would periodically um, uh, generate a report for the client's aircraft that would look at a whole bunch of critical um, uh, parameters that, that 
have to do with things like engine longevity and, and performance and efficiency and compare the um, data from the particular aircraft we're looking at with all of the data that we have for other aircraft that, that are the same make and model. So in effect, we'd be, we'd be grading this aircraft on the curve and telling him how, how well he's doing compared to a, a large cohort of other aircraft um, uh, that, were, uh, that, that, that we follow. So this particular report card is for a Cirrus SR-22. Um, and uh, it was based on 27 flights made by this particular SR-22. And it's compared with a cohort of uh, almost 47,000 other SR-22s uh, that, that we are, like, not 47,000 other SR-22s, but 47,000 flights by other SR-22s uh, that, that are in our database. Um, we also provide um, trend analysis reports where we uh, look at various parameters uh, over time uh, create a, a scatter diagram of, of the data. This particular one is maximum cylinder head temperature during the cruise phase of the flight. And then use analytical methods to try to determine whether there's a statistically significant trend uh, in the data. In this case, uh, a, a significant, statistically significant trend in the increasing direction of cylinder head temperature was, was uh, uh, detected um, in, in this particular aircraft. Um, so, you know, this stuff's kind of interesting, but it's not really predictive analytics yet. Um, the, the, our first venture into real honest to God predictive analytics um, started the next year in 2014 when we uh, launched a program called FEVA that stands for Failing Exhaust Valve Analytics. And the idea was to run all this data through a computer algorithm that would look for signs of a failing exhaust valve. In the piston aircraft engines, the most likely component to fail is the exhaust valve. And the primary reason that cylinders get removed, um, you know, for low compression is because of exhaust valve problems. Um, and failing exhaust valves are a significant cause of power loss incidents and accidents in the piston fleet. Um, so it seemed like a really important thing for us to, to look at um, from a predictive analytics standpoint. Um, and this, this first attempt, uh, what, what we now call FIVA 1.0, um, was uh, uh, based on some observations that, that, that we had done on um, on uh, exhaust valves, failing exhaust valves. Um, the, a couple of things about exhaust valve failures, the, 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 uh, they, they occur gradually. Um, so if we're doing regular bore scope inspections of the cylinders, and if the mechanic who's doing the bore scope inspections knows what he's looking for, and those are two very big ifs because the majority of the piston fleet does not get regular bore scope inspections, unfortunately. Um, Continental has been calling for bore scope inspections since 2003. Um, and still, you know, an awful lot of uh, piston GA mechanics either don't own a bore scope or own one that's just so terrible that, that it, you can't really see much. And a lot of them hardly ever use it which is really unfortunate because the bore scope is the best way of detecting exhaust valve problems. And if you inspect with a bore scope on a regular basis, from the time that you see a funky looking exhaust valve to the time that that exhaust valve is actually gonna fail, is something on the order of 50 to 100 hours. So, you know, if you're, if you're looking at the, at the valves every 50 to 100 hours, there's a really good chance that, that, that you're gonna catch the problem before it, uh, becomes um, a safety issue. But unfortunately, an awful lot of aircraft aren't getting regular board scope inspections. The other good thing about, the other good news about uh, exhaust valve failures is that they're relatively rare. And, and based on analysis of this gigantic amount of, of 
data that we've got in our database um, it suggests that, that, that at any given point in time, uh, only about two to three percent of exhaust valves are in the process of failing. Um, so it doesn't happen that often, but it happens often enough to be a significant safety problem and a, a huge expense for aircraft owners because most of the time when cylinders have to come off, it's because of a, a valve problem. You know, and as I said, borescope is the is the gold standard um, for diagnosing exhaust valve failures. And borescopes have come a, a very, very long way since 2003 when Continental first started calling for regular bar, borescope inspections. Um, and nowadays, uh, th those right hand pictures are ones that I that I took with my own borescope, and, and it's a, a Vividia VA400, the new model. It has an HD camera in it, it costs 250 bucks, so it's not terribly expensive. I mean, it's cheap enough that every mechanic can afford one and, you know, a lot of aircraft owners should probably get their own bore scopes. And, you know, you can see the, the stunning level of, of detail that, that the, the, the HD camera um, uh, can show. So the, the valve on the upper left there has a nice symmetrical bullseye pattern on it. It's a very healthy valve. That's what we want valves to look like. The, the valve uh, uh, on the right hand side um, is, is in the early phases of, of failure. Uh, probably not even far enough that the compression has been significantly affected. But that that valve is 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 going to fail unless somebody does something about it. Um, and uh, the, the bore scope is the best tool that we have for for assessing the condition of exhaust valves. So we'd love to see valves bore scoped at least every hundred hours, but this is very very seldom done, as I mentioned. Um, and you know, if 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 you detect a valve in the early stages of failure, like that, like that, that one on the, on the previous slide. Um, you usually can rectify it uh, without pulling a cylinder. Um, uh, we've had great success in lapping exhaust valves in place. Uh, and if you catch them before there's significant metal erosion or warpage of the valve, um, uh, you, you generally can just can lap the valve in place, not remove the cylinder and solve the problem. I actually did this recently on my own Cessna 310 when I had a funky looking exhaust valve and I did a video of the procedure that I used and it didn't even, you know, it was very non-invasive, did not involve dropping the exhaust or anything like that. It was all done through the spark plug openings. And uh, so if you're interested in seeing, you know, how, how I did this, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's a YouTube video. You can get it at, at this short URL bit dot, dot Lee slash lapping in place with hyphens in there. We'll take you to that video. Um, and I, this is this is a video I made I think last month, so it's it's it's, uh, it's very current, but it'll give you an idea of, of of how we can save valves without having to pull cylinders. Um, and we're trying to uh, persuade the shops and mechanics that we work with to do frequent borescope inspections, and then to use a procedure like this on valves that are starting to fail, so that they don't get so far that cylinder removal is necessary. But at any rate. Because uh, valves aren't getting inspected often enough with the port scope, <clears throat> um, we thought, well, maybe we can use engine monitor data um, uh, to try to detect uh, valves that are in failure, um, and, and that that would say, hey, you know, you really really ought to not stick a bore scope in there and look at it at the earliest possible time. Don't don't wait for the next annual inspection because this one looks like it might be a a failure candidate. So our, our first attempt um, was based on an observation that we made over many years that, that sometimes when exhaust valves are starting to fail, um, they produce a, a, um, an, an unusual uh, oscillation uh, on the EGT of the associated cylinder. It's a slow rhythmic cyclical oscillation that, that, that when I say slow, I mean really slow and typically is something like one cycle per minute. Um, and, and it's, it's here, here's an example of a, 
of a failing exhaust valve and, and what the EGT pattern on it looks like. And you can see that one EGT trace is, is oscillating and it's oscillating at something like one cycle per minute. And, and the reason it oscillates at one cycle per minute, which is a very slow speed, is, is because the valve um, has a rotator cap on it. It's called, you know, on a continental engine, it's called a rotor coil on it. On a light combing engine, it's called a rotator cap, but uh, its job is to is to rotate the valve a, a tiny fraction of a degree every time the valve opens and closes. Um, to help, they, they, the valve's rotated for two reasons. One is to distribute the heat load around the circumference of the valve, um, and the other one is to uh, is to help keep the deposits uh, off of the seat um, by the rotation of the valve tends to dislodge uh, deposits that build up on the on the valve seat. Um, and th these valves typically rotate at something like one revolution per minute when the engine is running at cruise speed. So that's that's the reason for the oscillation. Now this doesn't catch all um, exhaust valve failures. For example, we, we discovered recently that one of the common reasons for exhaust valve failure is that the rotator stops working. And of course, if the valve's not rotating, we're not going to see this oscillation in the EGT. So it's not going to catch all exhaust valve failures, but we thought maybe it would at least catch some. So, um, so we created a computer algorithm to look for this, this slow um, rhythmic EGT oscillation. And uh, we back tested it with a whole lot of data and we tweaked it to, to try to get it to 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 uh, alert on as many uh, known failures as possible and to minimize uh, false positives on, on valves that that, that aren't uh, that aren't failing and um, it, it's a lot harder than it sounds because for example there's a lot of tends to be a lot of noise on this data we have a lot of problems with failing probes and not properly grounded engine monitors that that, that, that get uh, noise in, uh, on the signals and so on, and so the the algorithm has to separate, try to try to not trigger because of noise, but trigger because of real, you know, EGT oscillations caused by exhaust valve problem. So we got it as as good as we could, um, uh, but we weren't really satisfied with the results we we uh, it, it wasn't as accurate as we hoped and in other words it, it, it had false positives and it wasn't as sensitive as we hoped so there were quite a few exhaust valve failures didn't get detected um so the we thought maybe we could figure out a way to do better um than that and the, this first attempt at FIVA that we did is what, what what's called an expert system, where where we um, we 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 try to get a computer algorithm to uh, to to do something that a human has been doing, and our our human analysts have been had been looking for this oscillation pattern for a long time, and we trained a computer to look for it. Uh, so we were basically trying to get the computer to duplicate what what humans were doing. Um, but the fundamental uh, limitation of an expert system is that it, it can only be as good as the experts that it's being trained to mimic and our humans weren't doing the greatest job of detecting exhaust valve failures either because a lot of them just don't produce this obvious pattern. Um, and, you know, basically we were only looking at one thing, we we're looking at EGT. Um, and, uh, might have been interesting to look at lots of other data to and try to correlate it, but humans aren't very good at, at detecting complex patterns in large numbers of, of data. Um, uh, but you know, computers are better at doing that than humans are, and and so our next attempt at at FIVA, what we wound up calling FIVA 2.0 was to use uh, use a machine learning approach um and, and to talk you know very briefly about what machine learning is all about uh, let me give you a, a, a non-aviation example S supposing we wanted to train a computer to look at at photographs of human faces 
and, and tell us whether the faces were male or female. There are basically two ways we can do that. One is to get a bunch of people together and say, you know, what characteristics do you look for in a human face to, to determine whether it's male or female? And you might say, well, you know, long hair is, is more likely to be female and, and facial hair is more likely to be male and square chins are more likely to be male and, you know, I'll come up with all sorts of, of, of rules that, that could be applied to, to detect whether a face is male or female and then write a computer algorithm to, to look for those things. And that, that would be what's called the expert system approach. But the other approach would be to just feed a large number of, of photos into a computer and tell the computer which ones are male and which ones are female and, and let the computer try to figure out how you distinguish one from the other. Uh, and and that's, that's what's called the machine learning approach where, where, where you, you don't try to tell a computer what to look for. You, you tell the computer um, what result you're looking for and you let the computer figure out how to do it. So, you know, simply speaking in the expert system approach, we, we feed, we, we put an algorithm into the computer and then we feed data into it and it tell, and, and, and hopefully gives us output telling us what we want to know. In the machine learning approach, we put data, lots of data into the computer and we tell it what the answer is and let the computer come up with the algorithm. Um, and uh, that's a much more sophisticated way of doing it. And for really complex things like, for example, figuring out whether a face is male or female from its appearance, uh, it turns out machine learning is a much better way to go. So we, we launched this project called FIVA2, um, uh, which is, was a machine learning attempt to, uh, uh, to detect uh, e impending exhaust valve failures. And most of this work was, was uh, uh, under the direction of my colleague, Chris Rather, who uh, is an aircraft owner and AMP mechanic, but also is a PhD in operations research and very sophisticated mathematician and really loves his stuff. Um, and so basically we, we took more than 30 variables from the, the engine monitor data, not, not just EGT, but just everything we could think of that might possibly be relevant and, and fed it into a machine learning model um, and, and fed hundreds and hundreds of training cases of, of engines where we knew whether the valves were failing or not because they had had a recent bore scope inspection. Um, and we, we, we tried to use these, this training set to, uh, to train a, a, um, a machine learning model um, to assess the, the likelihood that, that a valve was failing. Um, and unlike the FIVA one, which, which sort of came out with a, a binary thing and said, yeah, this one looks like it's failing or no, it doesn't. Uh, the, the machine learning algorithm would come out with a risk score that, that it just a, a numerical value for how likely it thought the, the, the failure risk on a particular valve was. And the higher the risk score, the, the more likely it, it, it felt that the valve was, was going to fail. Um, and the, the more urgent it thought it was that somebody stick a borescope in there and take a look at it. Um, th there are lots of different um, machine learning models. The, the one you hear most about uh, these days is neural networks. I, I, I drive a Tesla that, that, that has very sophisticated uh, neural network software that, that, that controls its self-driving capabilities. It's really pretty cool. but. Uh, neural networks require very large uh, training data sets, and, and we, we just didn't have enough known uh, training cases uh, to support neural networks. So we tried a whole bunch of different um, machine learning models and came up, uh, decided that the one that seemed to perform best was something called random forests. Um, and so the machine learning model is a random for forest model that we've trained with, with hundreds and hundreds of known uh, cases. Um, we came up with 
35 different parameters. Uh, some of them were raw engine monitor data. Some of them were calculated. Um, for example, we would, would calculate the mean and standard deviation of certain things and feed that into the model. We, we had some software that analyzed phase of flight so that we could um, uh, tell the, uh, uh, the machine learning model whether the aircraft was, was uh, on the ground or whether it was in the takeoff or climb or cruise or descent phase of the flight. And in some cases, including EGT, we performed a Fourier analysis um, to, to determine what the frequency spectrum, the, the basically looking for oscillations and determining what the frequencies were of those oscillations and fed the Fourier analysis results into the machine learning model. So the idea is we, we, we fed as much information into the machine learning model as we possibly thought could be relevant because we, we didn't know uh, which which ones which things were important and which weren't and, and it wasn't our job well, that's the job of the machine learning model to figure out so we just gave it as much as we could um, we, we searched our maintenance ticket system and and found 3400 cases where exhaust valve condition was known uh, because it had been determined by recent borescope inspection and we split that that 3400 cases into into um, uh, two uh, subsets. Uh, half we used to train the model, and then half we used to to test the the, the model after it was trained to see how good it was. Um, but we we would feed each one of these in, and and we would tell the model whether whether it had uh, an exhaust valve failure or not. If it if it did, I mean, a, a borescope detected exhaust valve failure or not. And if it did, it would we tell what cylinder it was it was failing in, uh, and try to let it figure out the best way to detect it. Um, and and for each own case, we 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 looked at the engine monitor data from from uh, up to ten most recent flights on that particular aircraft prior to the bore scope inspection, um, because we. We, we expected that if, if there's a failing exhaust valve, it's going to get, look progressively worse uh, on each successive flight as the valve is deteriorating. And so we, we, we fed the training data in, we ran the test data through to try to figure out how well this machine learning model actually could, could detect exhaust valve failures. And we were looking for two different things. We're looking for sensitivity, which is um, what percentage of, of the valves that were failing that the borescope detected did the model detect? In other words, how good is it identifying at real failures and how, how many is going to miss? And, and we also were looking for positive predictive value, which is how good is it at avoiding false positives? Because that, those are the two things that you really care about in a test like this, you know, how, you know, how, how good it is at identifying positives and how good is it at uh, avoiding false alarms. So, so how, how did this thing perform uh, on this test set? Um, well, here, here's, here's how it came out. Now this was, this was FIVA 2.0. We're now on FIVA uh, 2.2, I think, and we, we've improved it a little bit, but basically the model correctly caught 50% of actual exhaust valve failures. Which was considerably better than than the the, the expert approach, the FIVA one approach that we did. Uh, as far as positive predictive value, three out of four of the failure predictive predictions were false positives. In other words, FIVA would flag a valve at above average risk, and then when you stuck a borescope in, you you couldn't see anything wrong. Um, another way of looking at it is is like this. Um, um, we, we determined that about one in 30 valves are actually in failure when you bore scope them. Um, so that's 3% or something like that. A, um, a valve that was predicted by the model to have a above average probability of failure has a one in four chance of failing and a valve predicted by the model to have below average probability of failure had a one in a hundred chance of failing. So 
so the question now is 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 this good enough to to be useful and you know we expect it to gradually improve over time as we as we get more known cases that, that we can use to to continue to train the model but just where it is right now the question is is it good enough to be useful as a diagnostic test it's an abysmal failure um, be, because um, you know, three out of four times that it says a valve is uh, has a high risk of failure. Uh, you stick a borescope and you don't see anything wrong. So we don't we don't want to use it as a diagnostic test. It just isn't isn't any good. But as a screening test, it's extremely useful um, because uh, if it says that a valve has a high probability and uh, higher than uh, than average probability of failure. It means that there's about a one in four chance that the valve is failing. So, if you get a score like that, it's a it's it's it it's makes a lot of sense to to say let let's take a borescope in there as soon as we possibly can. I mean, all it requires is taking one spark plug, taking the top cowl off, taking one spark plug out, sticking a borescope and taking a look. So it doesn't cost very much to do that, um, but it's saying hey, this this one's worth looking at. Um, don't 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 just Keep flying until the next annual inspection, or you know, if the if if the risk score is very high, probably ought to do it as soon as you can. If it's a little, you know, not all that high, maybe you want to wait till the next oil change, but you probably don't want to wait till the next annual uh, to do it. So, as a screening test, it's very useful. As a diagnostic test, it's it's not uh, all that useful. And so, a good way of thinking of it is is the the way we use like a PSA test um, for, for colon cancer, um, or it's, it's um, um, you know, if you have a high PSA score, it doesn't mean you have colon cancer, but it means it's, it's probably worth doing a, it, it could be worth doing a, a biopsy or something. And so that's, that's really how um, we, we're using this. We're trying to convey to our clients that if they have a higher than, <clears throat> uh, the higher than average uh, failure score on a particular cylinder, um, they, they probably really ought to get a mechanic stick a borescope in there or stick a borescope in there themselves. You know, a borescope inspection is something an owner can do. It doesn't require an A&P to do it. All it requires is removing a spark plug, sticking a borescope in, take a look. So having this, having this algorithm now, um, we, we, we got into a little bit of trouble uh, in terms of how we communicated the results of of, of this machine learning stuff to to our clients. Um, it, it was, interestingly enough, when we started sending out FIVA two reports, and this was a couple of years ago, um, we got lots of complaints about the false positives. And you know, as they indicated, there's the, the three out of four of the of the of the above normal scores are going to be false positives. You look at it with a borescope, you're not going to see anything wrong. But the owners got really upset that that we, you know, gave them a report with a with a high risk score, and then they looked at the valve and there wasn't anything wrong. And then they complained that you know you you scored me at risk for no reason. We in you know on on the other hand, we got no complaints about false negatives that that. that you know, valves actually failed and they didn't get a, a high risk score and nobody was complaining, why, why didn't you catch this valve failure? But they were all complaining that we were alerting um, when when the borescope couldn't find anything wrong with the valve. So apparently our, our, our clients prefer getting good news that isn't true uh, as opposed to getting bad news that isn't true. So that was kind of an interesting lesson. Um, but you know what was very clear is that they weren't understanding uh, what the appropriate use of this information was. That that it's it's a screening test. It's not a diagnosing test. Uh, a high FIVA score doesn't mean that we're condemning your valve. It, it it's giving you guidance as to whether a, an early borescope inspection is worth doing. So our our first FIVA reports look something like this. This is for a six cylinder engine and and each. Uh, the, the the risk score for each cylinder was represented by a, a vertical bar, and uh, the the 
the the y-axis was calibrated as uh, below average risk average risk and above average risk and any valve any bar that got into a above average risk was colored red if it was colored blue if it was average and colored green if it was below average that, that seemed like a reasonable way to 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 present the data uh, but it turned out not to elicit uh, very appropriate responses from our clients because when they saw a red bar they would freak out and uh, th that wasn't what we wanted them to do um, and they you know we, we were using words like failure risk and uh, uh, above average failure risk and stuff and that that turned out not to be psychologically very good so uh, so we modified the the, the chart uh, so that it looked more like this, um, where we put on the on the y-axis actually put put a, a, a predicted probability of failure, so that they could see that even a high bar only was predicting a probability of failure of something like eight or ten percent, as opposed to an average probability of failure, which is like around three percent. Um, and and the the we used a color gradation as the bar got higher it, it it gradually turned from from green to orange but we never let it get red because we, we didn't want to freak people out and we stopped calling it a a a failure a failure risk report and now we just call it a condition report um well that 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 wasn't enough to to prevent the 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 freak out problem because we we still use the word failure and risk in a couple of places and people would react inappropriate to it another problem that we've saw which we totally didn't expect is is what we call the flat top problem and some clients would get upset if if their bars weren't completely even 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 if they were all in the average range or you know um, they, they, they didn't like the idea that some cylinders had a higher score than other cylinders and so on. So, so finally, we, we, we concluded that, that showing a, a histogram like that with the, 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 with the failure scores displayed was just causing more psychological problems than it was worth. And so what our, our risk reports look like now, or our condition reports, uh, our FIVA 2 reports, um, this is a FIFA 2.1 report. Uh, it looks like this. We, we show a picture of the engine. We, we put a little color uh, thing in each cylinder without putting a number next to it. And um, we have a legend on the bottom. And there's, if you read the fine print, it says if, it's an, if the cylinder is orange and it's a one out of four likelihood that the valve is in failure. And, and each cylinder that has, a, has an orange score and a, a above average risk score uh, has a, a little guy with a magnifying glass sitting next to it to try to indicate that we're suggesting that somebody uh, take a look at that at that valve with a borescope. Um, so at any rate that, that the, 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 the response that we got from, from from our aircraft owner clients to this stuff and, and the changes that we made to try to elicit an appropriate response rather than an inappropriate response I thought were kind of interesting. Um, but it's important to, uh, uh, the, the, when, when we provide this sort of information that owners understand um, what it means and what it doesn't mean. Um, so, you know, a, a valve that we determined to be of elevated concern, which is the, which is the terminology we're now using, we don't call risk or anything like that. Uh, elevated concern means there's a one out of four probability that the valve is failing. Average concern is one out of 30, which is about what it is for the for the entire fleet. And uh, low concern is one out of 100 probability of failing valve. And if, if it's elevated concern, we suggest uh, that a bore scope uh, inspection of the valve be done at the earliest uh, possible time. You know, the test generates a lot of false positives, but um, the cost of the false positives, the monetary cost is very minimal because it's very easy and inexpensive and non-invasive to take a top spark plug out, stick a bore scope in, look at a valve. It doesn't it takes very little time, um, and there's really there's no 
no likelihood of a maintenance induced failure or anything like that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's certainly very, very easy to do if you're doing it at the next oil change when the, when the cowling is going to be off anyway. Uh, but the emotional cost can be very high unless the client understands what this data, how, how to respond appropriately to this data and, and how, not to freak out just because a, a cylinder has an elevated score. Um, some, sometimes you can't win. We, 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 we got a, a, a text message from, from a client who, who got a FIBA 2.0 report that said, this is mean, not cool. Well, we looked at his report and his report was perfectly normal. It didn't have any cylinders above average risk. So we asked the client to clarify what he meant by the fact that it was mean and not cool. And he said, you sent me a report, so something must be wrong. So for, for him, any report is bad news. It doesn't matter what it says. And you, you can't win. So at any rate, um, we're, we're, we're doing FIBA now. We've, it, we, we're in our, I think, second um, uh, revision of it. And as we are able to feed more and more um, data about known uh, engines with, with valve failures um, and engines known with, without valve failures, the, the model gets smarter and smarter and it will, the, 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 these numbers will, will gradually improve over time. Um, it's a little hard to train these things because the, the incidence of valve failure is so low that, that by definition, we're not going to have a huge amount of of, of data. Well, the other problem is that so so few engines are getting regularly bore scoped that that, that that that's another reason that we don't get uh, um, a lot of uh, of good data. So uh, now I just want to talk to you briefly about what's what's next. Um, uh, the stuff that we're working on now that that we haven't deployed. One of our projects, is, which we've called SEBA, is is to detect uh, sticky exhaust valves. Uh, meaning a, a valve that is not sliding freely in its guide due to buildup of deposits and so on. This is a significant problem in Lycoming engines. And if it's not detected early enough, it can re result in, in significant damage. Um, bent push rods are fairly common. A valve strike uh, um, can lead to power loss, can actually lead to catastrophic engine failure if the valve sticks and fails in just the right way. That's not very common, but it is a serious problem, like I say, particularly like homing engines. Um, and we, we try to teach our owners to be aware of, of what we call morning sickness, when where, where you start the engine cold and it runs real rough when it's first cold. And if you turn on the engine monitor, you might see that one of the cylinders hasn't lit yet. And then as the engine warms up a little bit, it smooths out. And by the time you get to the run-up area, everything seems fine. Um, and most owners that aren't trained to look for that will, will ignore it and just say, well, it's just the nature of the beast um, because everything seems fine when the engine is warm. But it's an early warning sign of, of, uh, of sticking valves. So we're, we're starting off with the sticking valve project um, the way we did with with FIBA as a as an expert uh, as an expert would or an expert uh, um, an expert type of uh, approach uh, where we're trying to come up with an algorithm to detect morning sickness, which is basically cylinders that don't the, the, the where the EGT doesn't come up um, after being started cold uh, or come up in a delayed way, and, and eventually when we get enough. Um, known training data for, for sticking valves, we'll, we'll probably switch to an expert, uh, to a, a machine learning approach. But anyway, we're, we're working on this, hoping to get it to the point where we can, uh, we can deploy it uh, for, for our owners. And, and the other thing that we're working on, um, which is in alpha testing right now with, with a bunch of Cirruses, um, is, is something I'm really excited about, which we call uh, generalized anomaly detection. This, this is a, a machine learning approach um, to try to look at engine monitor data and detect that there's something, something not right about it that somebody ought to look at. Um, it's not trying to detect a particular thing. It's not trying to detect a you know, burned exhaust valve or, or sticking exhaust valves. It's trying to do something much more general than that, which is to say there's something about this flight that's not right. 
and we really need a human to pull up this this chart and take a look at it and try to figure out what's wrong. And the the way general anomaly detection works, it, it's it's really it's really pretty interesting. Um, um, uh, just imagine for a minute that we were only looking at at three different parameters from an engine monitor. It's uh, we're, we're looking a lot more than that, but just for just to visualize it in your head, imagine we were just looking at three things. Let's say it was EGT, CHT, and RPM or something. So if we ran a whole lot of flights into a computer and, and, and told it to look at, uh, at those three things, EGT, CHT, and RPM, and plot those that, that, that those three points in a, in a three-dimensional space. Um, and we ran thousands and thousands and thousands of flights into this thing. Um, it would, you develop a blob um, of, of, of points. Um, and you, you, you could eventually create this, this, this shape and it actually, if the three things were reasonably well correlated, it wouldn't it wouldn't really be a um, an oblong blob like this slide shows, but it would probably be a much thinner uh, looking thing. Um, but it would represent uh, a blob of what's normal. Um, and then if you if you took a particular flight and ran it through, you could look at where those uh, points of, of EGTCHT and RPM fell with respect to the blob. Were they inside the blob, which would suggest that, suggest that they're normal, or are they outside the blob that suggests that there's that, that they're outliers? Um, now, now, now do this in, in 40 dimensional space. That's a little harder to visualize, but that's really what we're doing with the computers. We're creating a, a you know, a, a, a blob in n space that that represents um, a, what a large number of engine monitor parameters um, look like when they're correlated together in, in this way, and we we we're, we're also dividing the flight into phases of flight um, because what the blob looks like in in, in at takeoff is very different than what it's going to look like in cruise. So we get these these funny blob shapes and here again i'm showing them in two dimensions because that's all you can get on the slide but it, it really this is all in 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 a, a very high dimensional space um and, and they're and n dimensional um clusters if you will of of what represents normal um and our our expectation is that that we will be able to use uh this technique after training it with a very large number of flights and we've got you know 4 million flights in our system right now we're just trying to train it with with flights from from Cirrus SR22s that we have quite a few of um, and to try to see how how well it does it at predicting abnormalities but it's it's you know it's a pretty exciting concept um, uh, and it's it, this is a technique that's been used um, in, in lots of different fields, but I don't think anybody's ever tried to use it um, for piston GA aircraft uh, before. And, uh, and I'm, I'm quite excited that it's gonna uh, be very useful because right now our human analysts who are very well trained to look at this stuff, but they only look at flights where the owner thinks something's wrong and says, hey, something was funny on my Last flight, would you please take a look at it? Um, but you know, ideally, we we want to look at the data before the client is aware of anything being wrong, and be able to warn him that something uh, isn't right before it gets to the to the point where it's actually detectable in flight. And so we're hoping that this anomaly detection algorithm will will be able to alert our staff of human analysts to look. At, at a lot more of these flights um, that, that seem that the computer thinks um, have have something about them that isn't quite normal. Um, and we hope to be able to catch a lot more problems um, that way before before they happen. 
so this is this is the work we're doing in generalized anomaly detection, and it's something I'm really excited about. Other other things that are on our list of things that we uh, are probably going to try to tackle, um, but aren't working on yet, is detection of abnormal uh, combustion events like de detonation preignition, and and flagging any flight that 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 seems to have something like that going on and uh, possibly detection of um, of problems with the with the valve train uh, uh, worn cam lobes or collapsed lift or something that's not allowing the valves to to fully open the way they should um, and we we think things like that ought to be detectable from from engine monitor data using the machine learning approach so uh, we're working on a lot of really interesting stuff. Some of it's deployed, some of it's still in R&D, but, um, but I'm, I'm really excited that this is going to, has the potential of, of significantly altering uh, the, the way we do maintenance. And as, um, you know, recent model G, uh, GA airplanes, uh, like the, the Cirruses and Columbias and Diamonds and stuff, have, are, are much better instrumented, have much more sensors, uh, so we get a lot more data from them than than legacy airplanes do and as that trend continues and we start getting more and more sensors in our airplanes um, we'll be able to do more and more uh, with them um, so I, I think that predictive analytics is the wave of the future in ga maintenance and the, it will have the same effect that, that it's already having in the airlines um, and the, the, over time it will increasingly be the airplanes that tell us what maintenance needs to be done when, rather than mechanics um, telling us what maintenance needs to be done with uh, when. So um, uh, that's all I have. I, maybe we can open it up for some Q and A. I, I do want to mention that um, that I, I do a monthly podcast uh, on maintenance uh, with my colleagues Paul New and Colleen Sterling. Um, it's uh, sponsored by AOPA, um, and it comes out the the the, the the first day of each month, um, available on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. It's very broadly distributed if you're interested. And if you want to participate, it's a call-in show, basically. If you want to participate in it and you have questions that you'd like us to deal with on the podcast, you can email them to our producer, Ian Twombly, at podcasts at AOPA.org. And if he likes your question, uh, he'll set up a a set a, 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 an appointment for you to uh, uh, participate on one of our recording sessions, which we typically do about the middle of the month. Um, I've got the four books uh, on uh, general aviation maintenance that uh, are available on Amazon or at the EAA bookstore or at Aircraft Spruce or wherever you want to buy them. So, and uh, so, at any rate, those are available and. Um, and just the last thing is, uh, I send out a monthly newsletter and some and weekly maintenance stories. Uh, so if you're interested in receiving any of those things by email, you can put yourself on the list by texting the word SAVVY, S-A-V-V-Y, to 33777. And a little text bot will ask you for your email address and add you to our, to our uh, mailing list. And you'll get our the monthly newsletter and the weekly maintenance stories. Uh, so with that, uh, Jeremy, do you want to open this up for, for some questions or anything? Predictive there analytics. There you go. I said it right that time. I didn't get it. Oh, you did. Tied. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> I just got tongue tied at the very beginning. I don't know. <laughs> didn't have my coffee in me already. That was outstanding, Mike. I really appreciate it. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and there you go. Let you see my face. <laughs> yeah, we got a really nice turnout too. Oh, uh, good. Can I download data from my engine to my Apple product, uh, JPI 300 to a uh, IO 550? That was a question that we had. Um, I I didn't quite completely understand the question, but uh, but what I can tell you is the the um, uh, that our uh, savvy analysis platform is totally web-based, and so it, it can be accessed from any device that that has a standard web browser on it. It doesn't. It, it's not PC specific or Mac specific or anything. You can you can 
you, you can access it, do the charting, um, upload uh, engine monitor data from basically from any device that has a, a browser on it. It's a little hard to use on, a, on, a, on an iPhone. It's a little bit small, but I've done it in a pinch. There was a question earlier. I think you may have answered it, but uh, we'll just re-elaborate. Was the valve failure caused by improper, improper leaning? Um, well, I don't know which valve failure was involved, but valve, valve failures are almost never the fault of the pilot. They, they are almost always blamed on the pilot by mechanics, <laughs> but they are almost never the fault of the pilot. Um, the, the valve failures are, are almost always hardware related. Um, they can be caused by, by the, um, the, the rotator cap or rotocoil failing and the valve not rotating anymore, which will cause one side of the valve to be exposed to a higher heat load than others and eventually start warping it. Um, we've seen a lot of rotator uh, failures. Uh, they can be caused by uh, buildup of deposits on the uh, on the valve stem. The, I think that when we when we move to unleaded fuel, we'll see a lot less of that. A lot less of uh, problems with 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 uh, sticking valves and problems with with uh, with deposit buildup because lead is really the the biggest culprit when it comes to that. And sometimes it's caused by by the valves not being set up um, properly in the first place. We we had a period of years where Continental changed their procedure of manufacturing cylinders, and instead of um, what are, what's called post reaming the the valve guides after they've been installed in the cylinder head, they were pre reaming them, and the result was that the that the valves and the seats weren't always perfectly concentric with one another. And we wound up having just major rashes of exhaust valve failures after the cylinder got to five or six hundred hours. And again, it almost was almost always blamed on the pilot, but it wasn't the pilot's fault. It was the hardware's fault. And while you're on that topic, can you elaborate a little bit on why that is about why unleaded fuel will be better for the engines as opposed to the leaded gas that we currently burn? Well, um, I, I actually wrote a, an article on that where I got into the chemistry involved, but basically um, uh, the leaded uh, aviation gasoline, like 100 low lead, um, has a lead scavenging agent in it called ethylene dibromide, whose job it is to convert the, the, the metallic lead into a gaseous form. Um, called, called um, uh, lead bromide that, that will hopefully pass out the exhaust um, and, and not start building up deposits on exhaust valve stems and spark plugs and other places where it can do mischief. Um, but the, the ability of the ethylene dibromide to uh, scavenge the lead is highly dependent on temperature. And um, so, uh, that leads to a number of, of problems. If, if the, uh, we typically have very bad lead, lead scavenging when the engine is running at low power, particularly on, during the, on the ground where, where it's running at idle or taxi or something like that. And it's not producing very much heat. And so the, the, the ethylene dibromide is not really able to, to do its job of scavenging. And so it's very, very important for, for pilots to lean aggressively on the ground, try to keep the combustion temperatures up as high as they can. Um, uh, another um, uh, problem that we have is, is the Lycoming engines have uh, sodium uh, filled exhaust valves that, uh, that dissipate um, a lot of their heat through the valve stem to the guide uh, uh, rather than um, dissipating it um, through the seat uh, the way continental valves do to a large extent. Uh, Lycoming valves um, typically dissipate about half their heat through the valve stem, whereas continental valves, which have solid stems and don't conduct heat nearly as well through this stem, uh, only, um, only uh, 
only about 25% of the heat is dissipated through the, uh, through the valve stem and the rest of it is dissipated when the valve is closed um, through, through the interface with the, with the guide, I mean, with the, with the seat. So Lycomings as a result have the lower part of the valve stem runs cooler and the, um, because the heat's being conducted up to the, to, to the top and they get more um, lead deposits uh, on the valve stems than Continentals do. And Lycoming has you know, addressed this with service bulletin 388C that, that asks for a wobble test to be done on the valves every either 400 hours or 1,000 hours, depending on what flavor of uh, Lycoming you have. Um, to try to detect a buildup of, of deposits on the valves before they cause the valve to fail. But it's been a, a significant problem with, uh, with Lycoming engines. And it's, it's related to the fact that we're running leaded fuel. And uh, so I think, you know, when the, the I don't know how long it's going to take for, for unleaded avgas to, to, to replace leaded avgas. Obviously, the EPA is pushing it really hard. Um, uh, but there's a lot of logistics problems that are going to make it something that doesn't happen overnight. But uh, but I think we're going to have a lot less problems with exhaust valves once we once we uh, change to unleaded fuel. Can oil analysis be incorporated into your data analysis? That was one of the questions. Um, well, that's interesting. Uh, not. Probably not easily because I don't know of any of the labs that that provide their data in in, in a in a computer readable format. They typically pr provide you know reports that are either on paper or a PDF file or something that 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 are meant for humans to read. Um, but there's no reason you know if we if we could get the labs to submit their your results as a you know a CSV file or something like that that could be fed into a computer. There's no reason that oil analysis couldn't be added as what we call a feature, which is an input variable to the machine learning algorithm. Um, the, the other thing that's a, a little bit difficult about that is that that the when when we're doing analysis of engine monitor data, we're we're, we're usually looking at particular flights and and oil analysis doesn't like doesn't come by flight it's it's it, it's for an entire oil change interval but the, the, so the answer is we're not doing that right now but but um th there's no reason that, that it couldn't be done if we could get um oil analysis data from the labs in uh, in digital form of course we don't we don't have a an oil analysis lab ourselves we mostly use uh, an outfit called Blackstone Labs in the, in Fort Wayne. Um, to to that that's the lab we 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 mostly uh, send our clients to for oil analysis. Uh, we have one question: Have you thought of modifying the evaluation factors? I have no idea what that question means. Maybe yeah, we can I'm get not sure an elaboration. I think that is, he didn't <laughs> verify that. Sorry. Um, can valves be lapped successfully in place without using abrasive compound? Um, no, I mean the, the the whole idea of lapping is to use an abrasive to to, um, to to clean up the contact area between the valve and the seat. Uh, the, the reason that the valve is starting to look funky is because there's some some place around its circumference that's not making good contact with the seat and the purpose of the the lapping is to is to mate get those surfaces to mate well um and if, if we can catch the thing early enough before the valve warps or a significant amount of metal gets lost then then we can restore the valve um, by lapping it in place if it if it's not detected until it, it's pretty far gone, uh, then usually the lapping is not going to solve the problem and the cylinder is going to have to come off and a, a new valve will need to be installed. But we do have the ability to, to, to catch these things early. It's just that, you know, most shops don't, don't do it. Um, we, we, we need to change the culture to, to one that, that 
uses borescopes a lot more often than what we're seeing right now. I mean, it's not every shop that doesn't do it, but an awful lot of shops don't do it. Here's a fairly popular question. I'm sure you've never heard this one before. How about <laughs> use of Marvel Mystery Oil in Avgas to relieve exhaust valve sticking? Um, to the best of my ability to to determine this Marvel Mystery Oil is is not effective in reducing exhaust valve sticking. It it has some had some success in in um, in reducing uh, uh, sticking of hydraulic lifters. Um, and occasionally, if we have a, a sticking hydraulic lifter, which you can hear is kind of lifter clatter when the engine's running, <clears throat> putting some Marvel Mystery Oil in there sometimes will will free up the lifter, but. Uh, it, it doesn't really help with regard to exhaust valve sticking. And if you, if you take a look at an exhaust valve that, that has these deposits on it, um, the, the deposits are, are are very nasty. They're very hard and scaly and very difficult to remove and not soluble in, in any solvent that, that I know. They, they basically have to be removed mechanically by by sand blasting or something. It's uh, so you, there's not going to be some miracle in a can you can throw in there to uh, to, to clear that up. Uh, Marvel Mystery Oil has been around for a long time. As far as I know, it doesn't do any harm. Uh, I, I haven't really seen any benefits from it other than um, uh, freeing up uh, uh, sticky hydraulic lifters. And I don't particularly recommend using it on a routine basis. But if you if you have valve clatter, I you know. It, it might be worth putting some in to see if it clears up the problem. Okay. Other than uploading our data to your system, oil analysis and routine inspection, and uh, are there any other items that you recommend trend monitoring to contribute to a safer operation? Well, I mean, definitely. They, they, the, the, the two most important things uh, as far as engine inspection are concerned are um, in inspecting the oil filter contents and um, and on Lycomings where it's possible to to re remove the suction screen and, and, and inspect that and to use borescope the borescope is is the best tool we have for looking at the top end of the engine and the uh, and and uh, looking at the uh, uh, at the oil filter and suction screen are the primary tools we have for determining the condition of the bottom end of the engine. Um, we see a awful lot of lycomings where the suction screen does not get removed. Uh, lycoming wants it to be removed, inspected, and cleaned at every oil change, but it's it, it it's another one of these things that's not done very often. Uh, a, lot, a lot of shops they they'll pull and cut open the filter, but they won't uh, pull a suction screen. Now on, on Continental, the suction screen is not removable, um, but on Lycomings it is, and it's much smaller than on Continentals, and it's very easy for it to get clogged. And we've seen a, a rash of problems, particularly in turbocharged Lycomings, um, where, where there have been you know, oil pressure problems and, and winds up being that there's the, 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 the suction screen is just packed full of carbon and stuff like that. So on Lycomings, it's really important to, to pull a, a suction screen, which is located at the bottom of the oil sump. There's just a little hex. Uh, I think it's a seven eighths inch hex that you unscrew to remove the, uh, um, the suction screen from a Lycoming. And that, that really needs to be done every time at every oil change, in addition to cutting open the filter. The, the filter will show you the, the the small stuff, and but the suction screen catches the big stuff, and you want to know about big stuff, <laughs> right? Not to jump back to the unleaded fuel versus the leaded fuel, and you probably mentioned this, but just to make sure we caught this, would any engine modifications be required if we were to change back to uh, unleaded fuel? I don't know if you talked about well it depends that. it depends on what fuel they the i mean the 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 stuff that's 
that, that's currently being worked on, the, the, the G100 UL that, that, that GAMI has and is waiting for, for one last FAA signature <laughs> on, 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 the, on the STC, um, is a drop-in replacement. It doesn't require any modifications whatsoever. Uh, all the only modification it requires is the two modifications. You have to change the placard at the fuel fillers and you need to put one extra page in your uh, POH and uh, flight manual supplement that, that authorizes the use of the unleaded fuel. Um, <clears throat> a lot of engines that, that are lower compression engines um, are able to run on 94 UL, which comes from Swift, which is available right now at, at, at quite a few airports. Uh, in fact, all the big news that, 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 that came out a couple months ago was that there were there are two airports in Santa Clara County, which is up, up in, near the, in the Bay Area near San Jose, um, that were ceasing the, the sale of 100 low lead. Um, and, and we're going to sell 94 UL instead. And a lot of airplanes can run on 94 UL if, if the compression ratio is is uh, is seven and a half to one or seven to one. Um, uh, they'll run just fine on 94 UL. Um, and there's like a hundred dollar STC you can get from Swift that says it's okay. But plus, Lycoming has a service bulletin that lists all of its engines that that are allowed to run on 94 UL. But if you have a high compression engine. Um, eight and a half to one compression ratio, or if you have a turbocharged engine, those can't run on 94 UL. The, 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 the detonation margin is just not enough. They need 100 octane fuel. But the, the fuels that are that are being worked on, and, and like I said, the GAMI fuel, which is all ready to go, pending a FAA signature, the Wichita ECO has already signed off on it, and they're just waiting for headquarters to sign off on it. Uh, that's just a drop-in replacement that'll work in any 100 low lead engine will run on G100 UL uh, and no modifications are required other than just some placards and a flight manual supplement. Can you analyze oil temperature to score potential engine moisture issues? Um, well, yeah, that's a good point. The, the uh, oil temperature is one of these things where um, there's kind of a sweet spot where we want the oil temperature to be. Um, and no, on, in most engines, oil temperature is measured at the coolest part of the cycle, right, right after the oil comes out of the oil cooler. That's normally where the, the sensor is located. And we, we normally would like the oil temperature to be in the 100, 180 to 200 degree Fahrenheit range. That's kind of the sweet spot. If it gets much above that, if it gets up, up above 210 or so, um, it, it has, the, has the effect of, of causing the oil to oxidize faster. Uh, it's, not, it's not a horrible thing, but, it, but it, it, if the oil temperature is consistently above 210, you really ought to be changing the oil more often because things are gonna start breaking down in the oil. It's not bad for the engine, it's bad for the oil. Um, if the oil temperature is consistently a lot lower than say 170 or so, um, then we worry about moisture buildup because the, the oil typically, as it's going through the, the system, it, it typically um, rises by something on the order of 40 degrees Fahrenheit from its coolest point, which is where the, the gauge is measuring it right after it comes out of the oil cooler to its hottest point, which is like where it's bouncing off the bottom of the pistons and cooling the pistons and stuff. Um, it rises about, um, about 40 degrees. So we want the oil temperature as indicated by the cockpit gauge to be high enough that the oil at the hottest part of its cycle is, is gonna be uh, above the boiling point of water so that moisture will, will boil off and, and go out the breather in the form of steam. Um, so if, if water boils at, you know, about 210, um, if you subtract, uh, 40 from that, you, you, you get, you know, some, something around, uh, 170, 
which is why we, we, we want to make sure that the oil temperature is, is, is above 170 so that the, 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 the moisture will, will, will get boiled off and not uh, keep accumulating. The, the combustion of hyd hydrocarbons produces, you know, the, basically the, the byproducts of production of combustion of hydrocarbon is, is, is carbon dioxide and, and water. Um, and most of the water goes out the exhaust in the form of steam, but some of it gets past the compression rings and gets into the crankcase. So just by virtue of flying the engine, we, we do have a constant stream of moisture going into the crankcase. Um, it's just it's just inevitable. And we need we need to make sure that that moisture um, it goes out the breather in the form of steam rather than uh, being uh, liquid water that, that that sits in the in the crankcase and has a potential of corroding very expensive things down there. So that's why we always want to see indicated oil temperature above above about 170. Now you know if you if you're flying up at, at higher altitudes, the, the boiling point of water is lower at higher altitudes. So you could get away with a little lower oil temperature when, when you're up high. Um, but oil in, in, in our engines is thermostatically controlled. And so if, if everything is working right, the, the thermostat, the vernotherm, will, will hold oil temperature in, in that range somewhere between 180 and 200. That's what we're kind of looking for. If it gets above 210, it means that the engine is producing more heat is, is, is shedding more heat into the oil than, than what the oil cooler is capable of dissipating. Um, and so the system isn't, isn't able to thermostatically control it. Um, and if it's, if it's too cool, uh, it, it means either the vernotherm isn't working right or there's something about the, the oil cooling system that's not capable of, of, of keeping the temperature in that sweet spot, which is where it's supposed to stay. Wonderful. Well, I think that runs us out of just about out of time, sir. Do you have any final thoughts, any things that you'd like to part with before we close it up for tonight? We've got still a bunch of comments and engagement in the chat. Um, not really. If, if anybody didn't get a, has a question, didn't get an answer, or if I didn't understand the question. Um, there were a lot of them. Let, let me just hear all let me night. Just, uh, let me just go put up my uh, uh, my uh, email address again here. Yes. Um, uh, but but feel free to email me. I'm I'm always happy to answer questions and so on. Uh, and uh, I'll make sure to push that out too as well, Mike. Uh, when I push out the recorded link, because there's a lot of folks on my distribution that. Uh, always like to get the recorded version because they can't join in on the live sessions. So I'll mm -hmm. make sure that they get your email as well. Right. Yeah, sure. Glad to do that. Wonderful. Okay. And, they, and any of you guys that are going to be at uh, AirVenture this year, um, I'll, I'll be doing probably about a dozen um, different uh, talks on the forums plaza. So hope to meet some of you up there. Yeah, I'm hoping to be up there as well, but I'm not entirely sure what my schedule's look shaping up to be like for this summer yet. So, and ladies and gentlemen, I apologize if I didn't get to every single person. There was a lot of engagement. I want to thank everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, Mike. Okay. Um, let me. There let was me a, oh. I guess I guess I didn't have to. You got. Yeah, I got, you got the, the master controller. I, I've got the controls. <laughs> There was a lot of engagement. Your, to your my, airplane. My, my flight controls. <laughs> there was a lot of engagement tonight. I want to thank everyone for participating. I want to thank Mike for coming back and for his uh, excellent presentation and expertise. Uh, if you have any questions for me, send me an email at flyallamerican at gmail. You can follow me on uh, social media, YouTube, All American Aviation, on Facebook and Instagram. And then you can find uh, Mike at Savvy Aviation and then Mike's YouTube channel is at that link as well and then of course uh, you saw his email address if I didn't get to you I apologize um, feel free to email Mike at that email address that he presented and uh, 
Uh, if this is the first time you're joining to my Breaking the Chain program, I'll be uh, joining in, uh, I'll, I'll be uh, returning back uh, late August, September timeframe uh, with uh, new webinars uh, with more featured guests. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for your participation. This is uh, two years in the run now on this webinar format, and I've had great uh, individuals like Mike and uh, other wonderful uh, guests. And uh, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to uh, um, partake in these type of venues and share our passion with uh, promoting aviation education and safety. So have a great summer. Um, fly safe, keep learning, and uh, never give up on dreams. So long. Night, everybody. Good night.